Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Norbu Tensing, Vice President of the American Himalayan Foundation. Norbu Tensing has close familial and professional ties to the Himalayas and is the son of Tensing Norgay, who climbed Mount Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary and was named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential people in history. The American Himalayan Foundation was founded to improve the lives of Himalayan peoples while enabling them to maintain their traditional ways and culture. The foundation provides health and human services, education for children and youth, and support in preserving historic structures and ancient monasteries. Norbu has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Norbu, for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Mark. So let's talk a little bit about the American Himalayan Foundation, um, the programs that the foundation supports, and, and then let's talk a little bit about the, the milieu in the Himalayas and some of the challenges that, that the people of the Himalayas face. Sure, sure. Well, the American Himalayan Foundation was uh, founded by um, Richard Blum, who was a local San Francisco investment banker who went to the Himalayas in the late 60s and was sort of traveled there and was enjoyed the beauty of the mountains and, the, um, and was touched by uh, the hospitality of the, of the people there, but he couldn't help but notice uh, their daily struggles to survive and sort of came back and wanting to do uh, something to give back to a p part of the world that meant a lot to him. And that's how this got started. Today, the foundation has some 140 projects all over the Himalayas, helping people uh, who are in most need in areas of health and education, uh, the environment and the preservation of culture. What happens, I think, is when people go to that part of the world, the mountains have uh, a powerful influence on, uh, on the minds of people and, their, and the experience that people have through their personal adventures, I think, motivates them to want to come back and do something. And that's what the organization has sort of been uh, built around. Edmund Hillary was one of the inspirations to beginning uh, this organization, the model of development that um, he had undertaken for his work with the Sherpas is similar to what we've done, or Richard Blum did, which in essence is to um, go to an area uh, and respond to the priorities of the local people and not vice versa. I think that's really important. Not just to uh, give grants, to give money, but to make sure that there's some sweat equity, make sure that people are uh, involved, people who are passionate about the work over there that are going to continue to run these projects. And so um, those are um, the individuals that we look for, and we start small before we um, grow some of our projects. Uh, we have a program uh, that started very small about a dozen years ago uh, and, and now has 7,000 girls in schools who were at risk of being trafficked uh, into India. So these young girls now all have an education or going through school. Um, and all it took was $100. Uh, and all it took was one visionary woman, Dr. Aruna Upreti, who went out to the communities, went out to the villages. And there's 7,000 girls in 400 schools around Nepal. Uh, there's a story of uh, the amazing uh, doctor in Kathmandu who is a Nepali a doctor who was trained in America, a U.S. trained surgeon that really wanted to help disabled children in Nepal but not work with the government. He knows the limitations of working with the government and the amount of time it takes to get the delivery mechanisms in place. So he started uh, very small and uh, so uh, over the years we've helped him build a state-of-the-art operating theater in outside Kathmandu and we're now doing some 1,500 surgeries uh, for you know, something like $175 a surgery. And uh, it's absolutely life-changing. Uh, kids being able to walk, uh, and not just providing the surgeries, but to provide them long-term care by mo mobile clinics all over the country. Um, so th those are the, uh, the, the heroes. Those are the people that make uh, things kind of happen on the ground. We've also been uh, working, obviously, in the Mount Everest area, which was inspired by uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and my father. Um, and so we continue to do the work over there. And you can see the fruits, fruits of, uh, of years of hard work in that area has now produced an area that is uh, rich in children who have been educated, uh, children who are giving back, uh, children who are now 
involved in the communities. Um, but there's still uh, a lot more to, uh, to do up there. When we talk about the ancient monasteries um, in the far west part of Nepal, there was a 15th century a feudal society, and the king of Mustang is the 25th direct descendant of the first king. When Richard Blum went there uh, some 15 years ago uh, or, or longer, uh, he asked uh, the king of Mustang what he could do. And he was surprised by his response. He said, why don't you help fix the monasteries and everything else will come. And we thought, well, he'd probably want education and health care for his people. But it was the revival of the culture. It was revival of the monastery that reinvigorated the community to now where we have some 14 or 15 daycare centers, there's health clinics, there is a variety of programs for, for youths, all kinds of activities that are going on there. And the only place where the Tibetan culture was uh, still alive and uh, somewhat vibrant has now been reinvigorated. And uh, it's, it's really wonderful to see that transformation. And eventually you want to hand this over to the locals uh, because you want to show them the way, but then you train enough people uh, so that they can continue. So when you think about this region, there are a couple things that are very interesting. The Himalayas, of course, have several government, government mm -hmm. entities, mm -hmm. um, some large mm -hmm. and dominant, some very small, mm -hmm. uh, some, some really tiny. And then in addition to that, even in areas that fall within a government, a particular government, um, individual uh, groups of people in many respects govern themselves. They preserve their own cultures, they have their own systems, legal systems and, and cultural systems. How do you approach providing the type of overarching uh, support and infrastructure and, and collaboration uh, in, in, in such a complicated uh, geography and political situation? And it's a very good question actually because we have to be very sensitive culturally. Uh, we work in Nepal, for example, which is a pre predominantly Hindu culture. And within the, hi the Hindu culture itself, there are many sort of uh, subcasts and subsystems. Right. You know, when we work with uh, the Buddhist groups, whether it's the Sherpas or the Tibetans, uh, we have our own set of um, um, cultural I says, nuances. So it's, it's very important to um, listen carefully, very important to be uh, respective. And the Himalayas in general, you know, once uh, you have a friendship, it, it lasts a very, very long time. And it's very important to work very closely, but we also want to be, you know, as an uh, American nonprofit organization, transparency right. is very important. And so uh, the due diligence that we do with every project that we undertake it, it is exhaustive. And in that process, there is a communication that takes place between our partners, the beneficiaries on the ground, our program, uh, people who, run, who bring the program to us, and those of us um, uh, in San Francisco and delivering the message to the board. And you generally are investing in individuals who have already uh, created something on the ground but are, but are trying to scale. Is this a bet on a, on a person, on a passion, on a, on a commitment, or is it a bet that is placed in some other way? No, it's a, um, it's a bet on a visionary individual who... Um, so it starts with a leader. It's, it starts with a leader. It starts with somebody who is passionate. It starts small. Um, and we guide them along the way to provide the assistance that they need. So you and provide also some, some advisory yeah, absolutely, uh, support? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, some of the most wonderful uh, proposal or projects we get uh, have... Uh, uh, very bad proposals. <laughs> There's some wonderful ideas, but people don't necessarily know how to put it in writing. Uh, so, so we help uh, with that process, for example. But we start small, and uh, not with the idea that we're going to get big, but if something takes off, something it's something that we believe in, and, and once we're in it, uh, we're in it for the long haul. So you, you think from the very beginning ab about sustainability, and part of this scale is you don't want to necessarily make a bet before an organization individual is ready to actually take advantage right, right. of the benefits of, uh, of that. And, and how long um, do you stay with a particular program? Some organizations 
um, think in terms of three-year cycles, and, and you have sort of three years, and then you have to find some other funding. How, how, how does, the, uh, does the foundation deal with that question? Historically, we um, have worked with uh, the groups or organizations or individuals just on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay. But then you realize when you, when you decide to put a bunch of kids through school, it's not just good for a year. You got to go in it for the long haul. So there's a commitment on part of the, the school itself to ensure that these kids are meeting the standards that, that we have. Um, so there's a variety of projects. There are those that are one-off, um, sort of you do it for one time and then it's done. There are those uh, that may last over a period of a couple of years. Uh, there are those that um, uh, keep growing, for example, and uh, you know, like this program that has uh, 7,000 girls in school. I mean, that's a big commitment, and that's something that we're really committed to doing. So um, it's a process uh, right now with the recent uh, economic uh, downturn. It's a process that we're evaluating a lot more uh, closely to, uh, to determine. Nothing would make us happier than to know that all the projects are self-sufficient, but that's never going to happen. Right. And, and in terms of, of how people uh, within the Himalaya region um, take this Western-based, the San Francisco-based organization, how do people perceive the foundation within the ecosystem and the, the business ecosystem, the nonprofit ecosystem um, in the Himalayas? Today, the world is very different than it was 10, 15 years ago. You know, with the access of the internet, uh, I can communicate with somebody up in the base of Mount Everest uh, today. That is something you couldn't do uh, not many years ago. Uh, our worlds have become a lot closer. As far as the perception of people from uh, our part of the world, uh, you know, we have a very high regard uh, for, um, for our friends uh, who sort of come back often. and. Um, we're sort of quite amazed by sort of the, the genuine affection uh, and caring that people who go to Nepal, people who go to Tibet, people who go to Bhutan, people who go to Sikkim uh, have. Lives have been uh, transformed uh, dramatically as a result of these relationships, but now the world is much smaller. It's just a matter of uh, one email that uh, puts people in touch, so. In terms of program evaluation, I would imagine that, particularly if you're investing in early stage programs, um, you can't just start setting out requirements and expect people to, to meet your requirements, particularly since, in a sense, the very act of setting out requirements could be taken as a token of disrespect mm -hmm. for the accomplishments and the work of the very people who you wish to support. Um, how do you approach that? Is it, is it a very much of an in-person question? You know, we try to be as flexible as we can, and that's really important. So, uh, you know, there we have a sort of basic guidelines, I guess, um, you know, as far as the community participation goes, you know, how committed the local individuals are, and what the community thinks of this project as well. Um, and the projects are all sort of variety of sizes that we have. But we try in evaluating our programs, uh, you know, we don't start a program saying, well, this is uh, sort of an early investment and we expect to take it this far. We don't, we just take it from year to year. Okay. And every now and then something happens, like this program that has, you know, that started with a couple of dozen girls and now it's 7,000 7, girls. 7,000 girls, I know. So that's something that we did not plan, did not expect, but, um, but we have the flexibility to, um, uh, to work in ways that other foundations might not. Now is there an ability to go back if, if the leader of this program would agree, is there an ability to go back to governmental entities and ask for annuity funding, or is that just not even in the cards? No, I mean, uh, we're always looking for uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships, but uh, our experience for the most part is that you're better off doing it by yourself. Um, and if you find a wonderful partner to work with and um, able to work in, in the ways that we'd like to have the work progress, I think that's wonderful, but those are hard to come by. Um, we're able to move quickly, we're very flexible in the way we work, um, and we're not sort of uh, caught in uh, sort of a very stringent set of, of guidelines. And so that makes it easier on the partners, uh, because I think that's really important. Sometimes what 
um, you see on paper is very different when you visit the project. Yes, so that in person it's very important. It's yeah. very important. And we have a wonderful um, uh, regional field director in Nepal uh, who oversees the projects and um, you know he does all of the um, due diligence along with our program director over here and once the programs are in place say okay Norbu it's time to now you know we got to go um, you know find X uh, for this for this project and so a lot of what I do is is obviously development and, and, and fundraising, but most of it actually just comes through private individuals and small family foundations. And do you connect in, in your development uh, work, do you connect most often um, uh, people with resources to particular projects, or is it a more of a, a general fund uh, type of an approach? There's a combination of, of both. I mean, I think uh, in development, um, you need uh, to have a strategy that is that encompasses everything. Um, Obviously, to have the general funds uh, to be flexible to move around is great, but there are people who uh, genuinely care about healthcare, genuinely care about education, about the preservation of the culture. You know, something uh, has affected them in their lives to be moved to giving towards something in particular, right. and and we and we try and and guide um, uh, according to their wishes. But we also would like them to respond to what our priorities are. Could you just sketch out the the scope of the organization, um, where their offices, how many staff? Uh, you talked about 140 projects. What type of budget does the organization? Our budget varies from uh, uh, from year to year, but we have about 140 projects. We have um, an office in San Francisco, which is our head office over here, and uh, in this office here we have um, about six people. And in Kathmandu, we have two field directors, one regional director, one field director, and a couple of people in the office, and that's it. And you know, a wonderful group of supporters from the Bay Area uh, and around the country. It's a small organization, but you can, you know, uh, but the money goes a long, goes long, a long way. way. I mean, it's, it's really amazing what uh, uh, a small amount here uh, can do in that part of the world. The difference it, it makes in people's lives, it's, it's absolutely staggering. I mean, in Tibet, for example, in the remote parts of Tibet, where you know, it takes six days to probably get there by, you know, by some funky m motorbike, there are no bridges. You know, so these people are traveling six hours to, to get to the other side, get to a school, get to the medical services. So for $10,000, you can build a bridge. But the amount of time, the amount of materials, all that, well, all we provide is the material support, in the, for, for example, but the community puts in all the labor. The community puts in their own money. And they all joined in this one effort. And now six hours is cut down to 20 minutes. Right. A lot of people benefit. A lot of lives are saved that way. Uh, kids can go to school. What do you see as, as the challenges going forward and the, and the transformations that, that will take place that will affect the Himalayan region? Well, I think uh, to start with, you know, we live in a very uh, increasingly in an interdependent world. The things that happen uh, in this country or in developing countries, um, whether it's the economy, whether it's the wars uh, um, that happen, have an effect on that porter that would be carrying your bag up on Everest. We have to work together. And I think that now uh, there are a lot more people in the developing countries that are educated, uh, a lot more qualified people. And one of the challenges over there is to um, have people uh, stay back. And that, that's difficult, but slowly you are seeing an increasing number of people um, you know, getting an education over here and going back. And we're seeing more of that. We're seeing a proliferation of um, uh, non-government organizations, small organizations. The youth is more engaged right now, a lot more educated. Um, and, and, you know, uh, this was very different just even, even, even 10 years ago. Um, and uh, people are um, a lot more sophisticated, uh, whether it's um, donors, whether it's young people over here or <laughs> young people over there. In the developing world, I think, to be flexible, to be quick, to be able to deploy quickly, 
Um, I think that's really important. And the difficulty with uh, big aid organizations is they spend a lot of time, a lot of money, uh, just just talking about wanting to do something. But uh, and you know, by the time they are ready to uh, take action, it's, it's it's too late. And that's one of the reasons um, you know we, we stay small and agile and uh, not affected by you know what what what, what the government uh, is doing. So. Well, Norbo Tensing, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, and thank you for creating a bridge uh, amongst different people. It's enriching to us all. So thank you. No, thank you, Mark.